It is now 15 years since Lehman Brothers collapsed in 2008 and there is still no sign that the economy is about to get onto, uh, out of the crisis. The Eurozone is back in recession. China's growth has slowed dramatically and, is on, and the country is on the brink of a financial crisis. So after a decade and a half of cuts, uh, austerity, crisis and instability, we don't seem to be one step closer to getting out of a crisis. The question that we must ask ourselves so why is this crisis so much worse than the crisis, say, of 1991 or 1988 or 2001? How come this crisis is so much worse than these other crises? That's the question that we must ask ourselves. And this is where Marxism, as opposed to the other various explanations for crisis, can actually provide an answer. Uh, and I will go to, and in this session, I will try to go through crisis of overproduction very briefly what we call uh, uh, organic crisis of capitalism, which is a different, and finally, how this is reflected in the present crisis that we've seen since 2007, 2008. Uh, and to, st to start off, a crisis of overproduction is what we describe when workers are not able to buy back the product that they themselves <laughs> produce. Because of the exploitation that exists in the capitalist production, the workers, the sum of the surplus value is appropriated by the capitalists, taken away from the workers, and therefore the workers are unable to buy back the product they themselves produce. This is not some, a new concept, it was developed by Marx and Engels, who derived from uh, these laws from the development of capitalism itself in the 19th century. And the way that Engels ex explained this, uh, well, the, this process in Antideering, he said, the expansion of the market, i.e. the ability of the workers to buy back what they can produce, cannot keep pace with the expansion of production. The collision becomes inevitable, and as it can yield no solution, so long as it does not burst the capitalist mode of production itself, it becomes periodic. Capitalist production brings into being a new vicious cycle. And then he continued and he described how crisis paved the way for recovery. He says, the stagnation lasts for years. Both productive forces and products are squandered and destroyed on a large scale until production exchange gradually begins to move again. By degrees, the pace quickens. It becomes a trot. The industrial trot passes into a gallop, and then the gallop, in turn, passes into the headlong onrush for, of a complete industrial, commercial, credit, and speculative steeplechase only to land again in the end after the most breaknet jumps in the ditch of a crash, and so on again and again. This is how Engels puts it in Antideering. And this is, of course, correct, but it isn't quite sufficient. The economic crisis of 1912, 1913, and World War I was a decisive turning point. Suddenly, a tremendous crisis engulfed world capitalism, which didn't just last a couple of years, but lasted for two, over two decades. And this was not a normal boom-slump cycle, like the one that Engels described. And in this uh, point, it the, what Engels, when I say it ha wasn't sufficient to say what Engels had said, it becomes, became clear. Because from this, you know, capitalism goes into uh, as a boom, and the boom leads to bust, and the bust leads to boom. If you really sort of want to, uh, let's say, uh, simplify what Engels was saying. From this, the opportunists, or the reformists, drew the conclusion that it is not a problem that capitalism enters into crisis, because it will always come out of them again. I.e., okay, we have a crisis now, we just tighten our belts, and then things will be better again, right? The capitalism will recover. So this formulation of Engels actually wound up becoming uh, insufficient to describe what was taking place because that did not take place after 1912, 1913, but it took 25 years before, before what capitalism once again were able to start uh, find a new equilibrium. And the only way it did so was on the back of two world wars, a number of, well, an untold number of revolutions, fascism and so on, all these convulsions. It was only on the back of all those things that it was able to re-establish a new equilibrium. So this formulation of Engels was very insufficient to describe what happened at that time. And Trotsky answered this question, the automatic restoration of 
uh, automatic uh, recovery of capitalism. It says the, the concept of automatic development is the most important characteristic of reformism. Of course, capitalist equilibrium would be reestablished if only the social expressions of class struggle did not intervene in this cruel game. So that's an interesting point that Trotsky makes. He says the social expressions of class struggle, like the class struggle intervenes in the recovery process of capitalism and makes it more difficult. He goes on to explain the misery that the crisis would bring, uh, and which you could indeed see, anyone who studied the 1920s and 1930s, the misery that the working class had to suffer and the peasantry and so on is there, uh, is very obvious. And we'll return again to the question of class struggle a bit later. The correct balance on this question was something that they uh, had to discuss, uh, and it was a crucial part of the discussion of the Third Congress of the Communist International, and that was 1921. And at that time, capitalism was facing a temporary upswing, yeah, it's 1921, um, and the question that was raised, would this be a permanent strengthening of the ruling class? Was this a sign that capitalism would recover? And we know the answer, it was most certainly not the case. But if, at that time, in 1921, it wasn't so clear and it needed to be discussed and answered. The Third Congress posed it like this. The crisis of 1920 is thus not a conventional stage in the normal industrial cycle. It is a deeply rooted reaction against the fictitious upswing during the war and the first two post-war years which were based on ruin and exhaustion. This is one of the most important elements in a correct assessment of the world situation. The normal succession of boom and bust took place along the upward curve of industrial development. During the last seven years, production in Europe has not risen, instead has fallen significantly. So it's not a normal boom bust cycle, and that was the conclusion that they drew at the con third Congress. So this was something different. And Trotsky, in his lead off to this Congress, uh, we would call it world perspective, lead off on world perspectives, he said the following. Europe's economy can only shrink and shrivel in order to achieve a degree of inner coordination. The curve of development of the productive forces will decline from its present fictitious heights. In such <coughs> conditions, an upswing can only be brief and, and primarily speculative in character. Crisis will be lengthy and profound. And that is very much what happened in the 20s and 30s, um, uh, and it is also very similar to what we see today. Booms, very shallow, and the crisis, lengthy and profound. So we have short upswings and lengthy and profound crises. He continues, he says, rise, decline, and stagnation. Along this curve, there are fluctuations. There is improvements in the economy or crisis, but they do not tell us whether capitalism is developing or declining. These fluctuations are like the heartbeat of a living person. The heartbeats show merely that he is alive. And the breathing and the heartbeat, it's like the business cycle. The breathing in and the out is like booms and busts, but it doesn't tell you the state of the person itself, only that he is alive. Obviously, capitalism is not yet dead, and because it lives, it must inhale and exhale. In other words, there must be fluctuations. But just as the inhaling and exhaling of a dying man is different from that of a growing individual, so is it in this case. I boom and bust does not tell you whether capitalism is in its youth or in its period of terminal decline, right? The fact that it exists. But you have to look at the broader picture. That is, um, is this a period of, it's a, in the longer uh, perspective, is this a period of growth and development of capitalism or is it a period of stagnation? That's the interesting question that we must ask. Now, in the USSR, uh, around this time, in the early 20s, there was a professor uh, of economics uh, for, who used to be a m member of the Socialist Revolutionaries. He was called Kondratiev. He was generally a proponent of market reforms. Uh, the NEP policy, which you know, have listened to the discussion this morning, you know what this is about. Um, and he was looking for comfort in the automatic stabilization of capitalism. And so although he didn't quite follow the simple boom and bust cycles, he then proposed a, a long curves of capitalist development. Like every 50 years or so, there'll be long curves of development, right? So, although, and along this line, then the 50 years, there would then be ups and downs. 
uh, well, periods of slower growth will give way to periods of longer uh, growth. So, but even this uh, doesn't really solve the question. And it is just simply an abstract and mechanical way of trying to explain the, uh, the, uh, the question crisis. And in addition, it has exactly the same effect, right? Yes, sure, this is a deeper crisis than the normal crisis, but eventually capitalism will find a way out, right? That's the general message which Kondratiev was effectively communicating. But, try, uh, but tr reality doesn't in, in conform to some abstract formulas. You can't find a formula for like, you know, every 50 years, every 60 years, every 20 years, capitalism enter into deep crisis. It doesn't flow that way. Uh, it, it's not an automatic process in that way. And Trotsky explained that the recovery of uh, capitalism was only possible on the backs of the working class. And that's a key question. And he said, if the Communist Party fails, then the mechanics of capitalist development supplemented by the maneuvers of the bourgeois state would doubtless accomplish their work in the, the long run. Entire countries would be hurled back economically into barbarism Tens of millions of human beings would perish from hunger, with despair in their hearts, and upon their bones, some sort of new e equilibrium of the capitalist world would be restored. And that's precisely what we see in the 20s and 30s, and obviously the Second World War, a complete barbarism, which was that period. And yes, on the basis of that barbarism, mass of starvation, of slaughter in the world wars, and so on, on that basis, yes, capitalism was able to find a new equilibrium, but it was only on that basis. It's not an automatic process at all. And it also was based on the failure of the working class to take power. Um, and he also added that such a perspective was not for the immediate future. We're talking about the early 20s. And the effect of attempting to resolve the crisis would have the effect of propelling the working class into action. He says, but such a perspective is sheer abstraction. On the way towards this, this speculative capitalist equilibrium, there are many, many gigantic obstacles. The elemental forces of capitalism are seeking avenues of escape amid heaps of obstacles. But these same elemental forces lash the working class and impel it forward. Basically, by attempting to restore the capitalist equilibrium, the capitalists were provoking revolution. And if there's something you know about the 20s and 30s, was that was a revolution after revolution in country after country, precisely in an attempt to restore the equilibrium of capitalism. Um, so Kondratiev was completely wrong in identifying this as an automatic ahistoric product, process. And the cor correction would only take place at the cost of great human suffering which would provoke the working class into action. In the sense, Keynes, who became politically conscious in this pre precisely this period, and who developed this theory in order to try to deal with the revolution and so on, and try to push back the working class, that was the idea of the general thrust of Keynes' ideas, he, he coined the phrase, uh, in the long run, we're all dead. To basically instill in the uh, minds of the capitalists, the idea that you can't treat the working class just as abstract numbers on the people to paper, the human beings, they have their own will, and they will not simply starve and die just because of the needs of a capitalist system. And this is a lot of economists, they basically have the, the automatic equilibrium economists. They, behind their formulas, they basically assume that the working class will simply starve and die, accept wage cuts and austerity silently in order for the long run benefit of capitalism. And it is actually, in a sense, similar to what both reformists and Kondratiev as well uh, was arguing. Um, and so people won't just allow themselves to be starved for the long run best interest of capitalism. So the process of uh, booms and uh, slums, and particularly these long uh, waves of capitalist development, is conditioned by historical uh, circumstances, by the ebbs and flows of a class struggle, not simply by economic equations. And Trotsky starts using the term organic crisis to describe this kind of phenomena uh, of the longer, uh, longer, uh, this, this kind of crisis that happened in the 20s and 30s. He described it as an organic crisis of capitalism, starting in the 1930s, when he described one of the 
brief upswings, uh, but immediately co collapsed into crisis in 1931-32. I can't remember exactly. Uh, it says, it started from a lower level than the crisis of 1929, and is developing at a much more rapid tempo as the new <coughs> crisis. This demonstrates that it is not an accidental recession, nor even a conjunctural depression, but an organic crisis of the whole capitalist system. It's not just simply a boom and slump thing, it's an organic crisis of the whole capitalist system. And this is where we get the term organic crisis from. And he's explaining here exactly the same point as he was doing 15 years earlier in, in the debates in the comments. Okay, it must be 1937 then, or 36. It is the revolt of the productive forces against private property, which can, the private property can no longer contain the productive forces which it had conjured up. And it is precisely a, a definite sign that capitalism has outplayed its progressive role and cannot uh, develop the productive forces, cannot take the economy or humanity forward. And that is what an organic crisis is. So what is so different about the way that Trotsky approaches this question to the, the way that others uh, approach this question? I'm not talking about other Marxists, I'm talking about like bourgeois economists and so on. And one of the things is that they're not treating the economy in isolation but as part of a wider political and social crisis. Rather than attempting to abstract this or that aspect of phenomena from human society, he takes uh, the human society as a whole. That is, you can't separate politics from economics. The two are completely intertwined. And the, what do we call this philosophical position? It's called dialectical materialism. <coughs> so the relation between uh, relationship between politics and economics is dialectical. That is, cause becomes effect and effect becomes cause. So the, uh, the cause, economic crisis, become, uh, get an effect, political crisis, which in turn become a cause of further economic crisis. If we don't understand this, we can't understand anything. But simply stating that a re relationship is dialectical doesn't actually tell us very much at all. Any relationship in any, uh, any, one, any kind of relationship in reality is dialectical. So it doesn't really tell you anything about what the nature of that relationship is and what the specific dynamics of this question is. It's uh, to say that the relationship is di dialectical in Marx's terms is tautological. I just, it doesn't say, tell you anything. It's a tautology. Um, I will... How, I don't know if you know Father Ted. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Father Ted, it's about a few priests living on a fictional island, Catholic priests, and they don't really know much about theology, and they are being visited by the bishop. And in order to try to uh, cover themselves for any difficult question that might be posed by the bishop, uh, the, one of the priests instructs the others to answer any <coughs> questions, uh, any questions have to answer the two uh, answers, either yes or that is an ecumenical matter. <laughs> so, uh, basically, to answer the question that is a dialectical question is to say absolutely nothing, because anything is dialectical. Um, and sometimes comrades have a tendency to use dialectics in precisely that way. You have to go a bit deeper than that, not just state it. And what we must do is to try to discover how the economics and politics interact in the specific, uh, in history as it unfolds. So I'm going to say, to try to give you a little bit of a potted history of the post-war period. So it's going to be very brief, a very sort of sketching, but nonetheless, I think it's necessary to understand where we're at at the moment. So the crisis of the 20s and 30s gave re rise then to uh, a period which was quite different. There was rapid productivity in the 50s and 60s, productivity growth, there was much investment, completely different to the 20s and 30s. And this was made possible by two things, the destruction of Europe in the Second World War and the political stabilization with the help of the Stalinists and reformists. And that's one of the key questions. The, uh, the fact that they could hold back the working class from taking power enabled the capitalists to once again find a new economic equilibrium. Ted Grant, in his writings, called this counter-revolution uh, counter in democratic form. I.e., you had democra democracies, but in reality it was a counter-revolution. 
they had set in, destroy, uh, uh, and killed off the revolutions that were taking place all over Europe, Italy, even in Britain, the way that the, um, uh, the massive movements that were taking place in the 1940s in Britain, in particular inside the army itself, which forced the uh, British ruling class to make all kinds of reforms, including the NHS, social housing, all the things that we are familiar today in Britain as being part of the welfare state, or most of them anyway. They came precisely because of this revolutionary impetus, which still existed at the end of the Second World War. And only by cut, they could only cut across that by massive concessions and <coughs> by having the Labour Party and the Stalinists lull the working class into comfort about the future prospects of socialism on the road of reformism. Um, and capitalism was saved for a whole period, uh, but as I said, only at the tremendous hum cost of tremendous human suffering. And the great illusion was born in this period of the forever boom. That is, the boom was going to continue from 50s and 60s onwards forever, and the forever reforms as well, combined with that, will get a little bit better, a little bit better, until effectively, of one <coughs> reform after another, eventually we will have socialism. That's how it was presented by the reformist parties. And to be honest, part, by the so-called communist parties as well. Um, and obviously this had a basis in material reality from the 50s and 60s. We did indeed get unprecedented growth and unprecedented reforms. So this formed a basis for these uh, um, illusions. But all of that came crashing down in 1973, which gave rise to a whole different period. Austerity and monetarism had replaced Keynesianism as the leading ideology of the bourgeoisie or leading economic policy of the bourgeoisie. The working class was defeated uh, and then had to be defeated in a number of uh, struggles in the, in the 70s and 80s in particular. And this enabled this policy shift, right, from uh, Keynesianism to monetarism and austerity. And this defeat, again, was no thanks was in no small part thanks to the Stalinist and reformist leaders who refused to utilize this crisis in order to take the working class towards, uh, lead them to take the seizure of power um, and the establishment of socialism. And this again, this defeat of the workers, again made possible the growth uh, of capitalism. But this time it was very much clearly on the backs of the working class. And we mustn't forget this point. The, uh, in this period from the 80s and onwards, there were speed ups, lengthening of the working day, lowering of wages, at the very least relatively. All of these measures that Marx explained the capitalists would take in order to raise the rate of profit. So um, raising the profitability would then, uh, in, in their, in the, was the measure they took. By raising the profitability, they made investments more profitable they encouraged investment, and this was the way in which they could then get out of the crisis on the backs of the working class. But this increased output, so you raise investments, you invest in more machinery, they can produce more products, and again, they still have to be consumed. Someone still have to buy these products, right? And this is to, and there is no capitalist that would be able to consume so many cars. I mean, they have a lot of cars, but they can't possibly consume all the cars that are being produced. And so the working class would still need to consume these cars, and therefore the, the, uh, the um, question of debt comes in. Because if you cannot get, if the workers do not get in their pay packet enough money to buy back the product, well then you can lend them the money so that they can buy the product that you produce. And so we have the growth, massive explosion in mortgages. You have a growth of all kinds of uh, 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 debt for buying uh, or a lending to buy cars. You have a massive explosion in credit card usage, which didn't really exist for working class people before. But now suddenly every worker had a credit card, which they could buy. You had uh, you, mobile phones, for example. Very rarely, most people don't buy mobile phones on uh, in a even small things on mobile phones. They don't buy them out up front, <coughs> but they pay on a monthly basis, which is basically a lending of the. the the producer lends money to the consumer to make it possible for them to purchase their product. And the same goes for uh, TVs, even sofas and furniture. Everything is done on credit. And this was a way, obviously, of extending the purchasing power of the working class without actually giving them higher wages. 
So the capitalists are just, and even the companies themselves, they're just lending work money to the workers in order to be, buy back the products that they were producing. 1996, the total debt in the world, I think this is, was 197% of GDP. So this was some years into the process as well. By 2007, it was 278% of GDP. So it's a massive increase only those 10 years. And now it's 348% which again is a massive increase. And, then, and obviously the higher it gets, the more difficult it, will be, it becomes to manage. Every downturn there was in the economy, every small uh, boom slump cycle, they every small slump that they entered into, they immediately responded by lowering your interest rates in order to fuel once again the credit boom. And uh, the cheap and borrowing and then push debt even higher. Particularly, this is obvious in the housing market, the mortgages and so on, where constantly pushing more and more and more uh, debt into the mortgage market and cheapening the cost of borrowing so that people could borrow more and more and more money to uh, buy more and more and more and more expensive houses. Which then again, they could then borrow against the, when the value of their houses increased, then they could borrow against the value of their house increase to maybe make some renovation of the house or buy a car or go on a holiday or whatever. So this constantly fueled credit bubble. Uh, but even in spite of all of these measures that they took, investment and productivity growth never recovered to the way, to the level they had been before. The annual increase in capital stock in Germany went from in the before 1970s, it was 8% per year. It, it then fell to 2% per year in Germany in this period. And in the US, it fell maybe not as dramatically, but still nonetheless from 4% until 3%. So this was all before 2007. And 2007 really was when the debt uh, bubble burst. They call it the subprime mortgage crisis. And a little bit later on, the credit crunch. And the reason they use those words is to try to pretend basically that this was just an accident, this is a, temporal, a temporary phenomena. And once we solve this credit crunch by injecting more, uh, by bailing out the banks effectively, then we can go back to normal as it were. But in reality, as we know, accident merely reveals necessity. The way they patched it up in 2008, and then they began to reinflate the bubble. And this was particularly uh, evident in China, which at that time, in 2007, didn't have so much debt. But then they began in a really massive way to, accomplish, to basically catch up to the West in levels of debt. So in, they accomplished in 10 years while well, taking 30 years in the West or something like that, when it comes to catching up in debt. By 2010, the economy had begun to recover but now it was combined with massive attacks on all fronts, leading to massive political instability, culminating in the Arab Spring, the massive movements in Southern Europe in several waves. Um, we had the growth of the left reformists in Spain, Greece, Britain, United States, France, but also the right-wing populists, whatever you want to call them, <coughs> right-wing demagogues, Trump, Bolsonaro, and Boris Johnson as well, the Brexiteers. So this political instability that developed as a result of the cotton austerity forced them basically to bring this to a halt before they'd actually accomplished the task of bringing some kind of a career, bringing back to the economy. And to, and to be perfectly honest, the entire attempt to reinflate the bubble, the entire attempt to constantly <coughs> push more and more credit into the system is uh, not to let companies go bankrupt, uh, um, those who uh, borrowed money to buy their houses, not to let them go bankrupt, to try to re constantly reinflate the debt bubble in itself is a way of trying to keep the capitalist system float afloat in order to stop the social and political consequences of a collapse. Because it's not from an economic point of view, it makes absolutely no sense because you need to get rid of this fictitious capital somehow. You need to get rid of the debt in order to start back on a positive, on a balanced note. But the impossibility of that is, becomes clear once you understand the uh, political consequences that capitalist class would have faced. They, couldn't, they didn't dare to take the uh, working class on head on. So by the end of 2019, we brought the end to the longest recovery in history, they said. 
uh, which was uh, also the also known as the rec uh, the feel bad recovery. Um, the recovery, which no one really <coughs> noticed, was a recovery. They entered brought to end the lo longest recovery in history with record low interest rates. Interest rates are typically meant to be for when below when you were in a recession, and then ra rise as you come in, in in the recovery. But at this point, the end of the recovery with record low in interest rates. And there was no recovery for this entire period, 2012 to 2019. There was no recovery in investment. Um, and the, uh, Trotsky really to explain this political aspect of the policies of the capitalist class, uh, also in this uh, in 1921. He said, the government continues to be the largest artificial market. Workers received various governmental subsidies to their wages in various forms, and capitalism was thereby preserved through this dangerous period of military demobilization. Does the fictitious boom help capitalism to maintain its ground? And that's really the policy which they've adapted uh, ever, uh, ever since the beginning of this crisis, trying to keep capitalism alive. And in the period of the pandemic, they did this but at the nth degree. The amount of money they shoveled into the system to keep it going was completely unprecedented. And the, and the inflation came as a, as a very obvious consequence of that. Yeah. So when, when talking about the crisis, uh, economists typically blame uh, a, a crisis on this or that bad political decision, or this or that war, this or that natural catastrophe, this or that government. But they fail to explain that these decisions, these poor decisions by politicians, themselves are a result of the capitalist crisis, as well as the wars are a result of the capitalist crisis. The Ukraine war was part and parcel of heightened international tensions and the intensifying class struggle inside the nations, which forced the uh, imperialist countries to try to export their social problems onto each other, which is called known as protectionism. Uh, so in, in that sense, um, the political instability is both a cause, but both caused by, is both an effect of the crisis, but yet also it's the cause of the further economic crisis. Hegel put it this way, though the cause has an effect and is at the same time itself effect, and the effect not only has a cause, but is also itself cause. In order to put the economy back on a healthy footing, they would have to squeeze the fictitious capital out of the system. And the way that Trotsky describes this again, a new stage must begin in order to eliminate the contradiction between the superstructure of fictitious wealth, debt in our case, and the poverty that underlies it. The economic body will continue in the future to be racked by spasms of this type. Altogether, as I have said, this offers us a picture of profound economic depression. This econ depression will compel the bourgeoisie to press the working class harder and harder. So precisely, the, the economic crisis propels the bourgeoisie to attack the working class, but yet again, those attacks have a consequence on the co constant political instability. And therefore, the, work, the ruling class, rather than trying to take this, this jump and try uh, launch an all round confrontation with the working class, which they fear they will lose, they try to retract from complaint, and thereby the crisis gets massively extended, even compared to the 20s and 30s. We sometimes say, well, the working class now is stronger than it's ever been in history. The base, social basis of reaction don't exist anymore. So in the 20s and 30s, they could rely on fascist gangs to help them at, uh, smash the, working, the resistance of the working class, smash the trade unions and so on. But today, those don't, re don't really exist, and those pathetic showing yesterday in uh, the, uh, on Whitehall where they tried to push around the police. I mean, it, it, the balance of forces is clear. It's one million versus a thousand or so. It's like, I mean, we have more comrades now in our organization that the fascists were able to mobilize in defense of Remembrance Day yesterday. This is the like, level of forces. And that's also why the capitalist class, they don't feel confident in launching an all-out assault on the working class. And that's why they cannot escape the crisis. So they're constantly trying to take one measure or another, not, not to face the evil day when they have to confront the working class head on, and, instead, and therefore they cannot find a resolution to the crisis itself. 
So all this does is to prolong the inevitable difficulty. Uh, and it drags out with no end in sight. Of course, it cannot drag on forever. But at the moment, the, uh, this has crisis lasted for 15 years. And there really is absolutely no sign that it is about to come to any kind of conclusion. Um, and if it would were to find a way out, if capitalism were to find a way out, at what cost would it be? In the 1920s and 30s, it almost destroyed civilization. The Second World War was, uh, came perilously close to destroying human civilization. But at our, in our days, can anyone seriously imagine that uh, we can have another 70 years of capitalism without them completely destroying human civilization through environmental crisis, through wars, or something else? You can see what is taking place on the world scale today. You can see that, well, if they were to come out of the crisis, it would be a complete disaster for humanity. And obviously that is what our role is, to prevent precisely that from taking place and to ensure that this crisis does not lead to a new economic boom for capitalism in whatever form that would take, but rather to the establishment of workers' power and a socialist world federation. <laughs>